All right, so this is the third recording of our um, refresher course, our Pass the CNA exam refresher course. So um, you are halfway there. We went over um, my strategy, confusion to conclusion to answer multiple choice questions. And then also we did concepts and how for you to cluster information. So now we're gonna do a straight to the point bulleted review Again, remember this is for people who've already taken the CNA class, but it might be a while, they might need a refresher. So I'm going to get to the nitty gritty of the most important topics. Um, and so you could play back this recording again and take notes. And so you have note pages in both of the eBooks or in the CNA notebook, one of the eBooks, okay? Um, so that you can cluster information. So after this, we're gonna have the principles for all of the lab skills, which will be the fourth lesson. And then we're gonna go over um, exams, which is the fifth lesson, all right? And so you'll be totally prepped to take the state exam. So let me open this whiteboard here. Okay, so I have located my whiteboard here. So now, before we get into a review, you have to understand the players, right? That is part of makes up the CNA's um, role or the CNA collaborates with. Um, and you'll understand that there'll be some test questions that come from this, right? So first and foremost, let me get my pen, and this might get a little bit messy, but you can rewind here. It's not about the neatness here, it's for you to understand. First, the patient, right? So what makes up a patient? The patient is the mental, um, the physical, and the psychosocial, okay? Um, and so you have to remember those three make up a patient. The patient's always the center of care. So you might get a test question simply talking about that. And let's talk about other attributes um, that will comprise or um, exist within your patient that you might get tested on. You are definitely going to get a question of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Go back into any CNA book. Um, let me go back to the first page. I think I switched it. So you are always going to get tested on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the triangle, here are um, the types of questions that you'll get. Now, some questions get confusing depending on how the um, writer of the question worded it. The base of the triangle, right, is the foundation um, but if they ask you to put something in order, it's not the least important, it's the most important, right? And a quick review, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, simply say that needs have to be met in order. Like in this bottom here are your physiological needs, okay? So your physiological needs are your needs for water, um, H2O, let me put a text box, are your needs for water, bowel elimination, urine elimination, because um, people always remember water, oxygen, food. But remember, if you don't pass your bowels, um, you could die from that too, or um, unable to urinate, that's equivalent to death as well, okay? So all your physiological needs, what your body needs to happen in order to survive. So if you don't have water and you're dying from dehydration, you're not going to get to the top of it here which is self-actualization. I'm just going to put S-A. Self-actualization, you could think of it as somebody, maybe Gandhi or Martin Luther King or Mother Teresa, or I'm just using all of these examples. These are people that maybe everyone would agree that they fully achieved what they were put on this earth to achieve, right? Um, so you're not going to get to that level if you are, you don't have oxygen. Your body prioritizes this base first. So you're going to get Maslow's hierarchy of needs questions. And I'm making a note so that you don't um, forget because they'll say the base of the triangle or which one's most important. And a lot of students always miss up thinking base lower, least important. And that's not the case in this type of triangle, okay? After the physiological, you have safety, which is extremely important because safety, um, we'll talk about it, is a big concept for nursing assistants um, and everything they're gonna layer 
uh, questions. So remember on the second recording, we talked about layering concepts during questions. And so that's why safety is important. So safety could be like shelter. Um, when you go to school, you're able to learn and participate because you're not worried that bullets are going to be flying through the walls, right? So after your physiological needs are met, you have safety, then you have love, all right, intimate love or family love, right? Love and belonging. Again, CNAs always like people participate in group activities and things like that. So again, don't just think about it in intimate terms. You have esteem, your self-esteem, okay? Um, and then you have self-actualization. So again, this is a review. You're always, always, always going to get a couple of Maslow's hierarchy of needs questions. Now, in terms of culture, every patient has a culture. And remember that you have to respect everyone's um, right to practice their culture. Hindu, Seventh-day Adventist, um, uh, Jehovah's Witness, right? They don't um, accept blood transfusions. Muslim, uh, Christianity, anything like that, you have to ex uh, accept someone's um, religion and their culture. Culture meaning, um, for example, in Jewish culture, sometimes when the person passes away, they go straight, they don't go to the morgue in the hospital, they go straight to a Jewish morgue, and forgive me if it has a particular name, but um, I'm just representing the fact that those are the type of culture questions you're going to have, and the question might read something like, you know, a patient says that they believe in this, which is different from what do you believe, what do you do, and that's a trick question, the answer is you just support their care, there's nothing, you don't project your own thoughts onto the patient. Now, anatomy here, we're not doing a full review of anatomy. You need to know a little bit about the body systems, but it's not an anatomy and physiology course, okay? So these are our components really that's going to make up the patient and certain questions are going to come from there. So now let's talk about CNAs. The number one interaction is with the nurse, right? It's called the certified nursing assistant. So we need to understand how you interact with the nurse and what questions might come from there. First, you need to understand to assist the nurse, you need to understand um, the nurse's role. So the nurses operate under something called a nursing process, okay? Um, and it's not that you're getting tested on the nursing process per se, but you need to understand how CNAs fall into the nursing process. All right, the first step of the nursing process is assessment. Okay, and this is important. I do spend time telling my CNAs this because when a CNA, um, think about it, when a CNA observes and reports, which we will talk about, and they write down numbers, like they write down 300 of urine, the urine is yellow. You're doing a lot that when the nurses look at your documentation or the report you give to the nurse, you're helping him or her build the assessment of what's going on with the patient. And then the nursing process go on into um, diagnosis, planning, implementation, evaluation. But this is really what I wanted to point out with this the assessment. Another thing is that nurses delegate to you, and we'll talk more about delegation, you will get a couple of delegation questions, and I believe we referred to it on the second recording. So delegation um, is that when a nurse, and you have to look at states, um, the state rules, all RNs can delegate to a CNA. Some states, they differentiate to how much an LPN, a licensed practical nurse, can delegate to a nursing assistant. And then nursing assistants cannot delegate to each other. So that is a test question. Nursing assistants cannot delegate to each other. You can ask a nursing assistant for your colleague, a fellow nursing assistant, for assistant maybe moving a patient because they're too heavy, but you cannot delegate, like delegate your assignment to another nursing assistant. Both of you are on the same kind of plain and in terms of hierarchy, okay? So the medical field has a hierarchy. You have MD um, and everyone's working together, but you, it's good to understand the authority. MD to RN, all right, to LPN. LPN is hard to draw on this. Um, LPN, 
and then CNA, okay? Um, so a little bit about delegation, just because um, they'll ask you test questions, say an RN delegates that you go give medications to a patient. Just because a nurse asks you to do something, there is such thing as inappropriate delegations. And so you have to understand your scope of practice and your job responsibilities to say that, no, I can't do that. What if a RN asks you to go slap a patient, right? I'm just being extreme to prove my point. So just because they have the ability to delegate to you, it has to be an appropriate delegation. And part of that is you're going to get tested on knowing your scope and practice of what you're supposed to do. So probably the quick thing and a scope and practice of a nursing assistant essentially is to help nurses and help patients with the activities of daily living um, activities. And that pretty much is the big bulk of it. Um, participate as a team. So scope of practice is something that you need to review. So right here, we've covered a couple of test questions, Maslow hierarchy of need, culture, um, delegation. You might get one on the assessment, CNA scope of practice. They're always gonna give you something, wanting to make sure you know that you're not supposed to do it. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about observing and reporting. That's gonna lead into documentation. Um, and we'll speak more about that, but know that a big part of your job is to observe and, re and report. So you have end of shift reports um, and when to go to the nurse and tell them immediately. Now on the second recording, we went over concepts. And so what I did is I take I teach the nursing assistant curriculum in terms of concepts. We have a book that's going to come out and it's going to help people um, that have different languages as well as going to be straight to the point. And um, we'll make sure you can get on the waiting list should you want that. But um, legal ethics, communication, infection control, health promotion, safety, and developmental stages. If you take a piece of paper, and remember, we practiced that on the second recording, and now we're going to just like plug in a little bit more, okay? So let's go to the next um, whiteboard here that I have set up. So I am really going to just touch on the most important things, send you to places to make notes on. Um, and because again, this is a refresher course, it's not reteaching the entire thing, but bringing out points that are important. You could replay this recording and this will give you a solid, solid foundation to pass the exam. Okay, so under the concept of legal ethics, and again, on the second recording, you were to go, your homework was to go and define each concept, okay? You have residence rights. This is the residence bill of rights. And so this is woven in, you may not realize into when we're doing the skills, which the next video will talk about the skills, but the right to privacy, the right to confidentiality, um, uh, the right to autonomy. And so all of those, just memorize them. So in your ebook, for those of you um, that are in the CNA refresher course, you got two ebooks. In your ebook, um, the Bill of Rights is listed there. Okay, we talked about understanding the scope of practice um, on your state for Massachusetts is mass.gov. Um, for any state, the Department of Public Health has the scope of practice for CNAs and you just Google that. Now, let me tell you some test questions that'll come uh, with work. I gave you one on the last screen. Um, as a CNA working, legally and ethically, ethically, you're not supposed to do anything that's outside of your scope of practice, even if you are delegated to do so, because you're supposed to identify that it's an inappropriate delegation, okay? Um, and so a couple of things, the Hoyer lift is not part of the regulations and CNA programs. Um, now we have a Hoyer lift that students can see, but you don't get tested on it because you're supposed to go and receive training at a facility um, before you can use the Hoyer lift. Um, I'm trying to think of other things, legal and ethical issues. Um, again, if a doctor asks you to do something, uh, you can't take an order from a doctor. They have to, you have to go get the nurse um, for the doctor to take the order. So those are kind of questions that they ask 
kind of that's like a legal and ethical standpoint. And we did speak about delegation. All right, so this is not completely everything, but these here, if you understand these four, you have a good basis under the concept of legal and ethics. Under the concept of communication, remember there's different types of communication. When you, the CNA, are um, communicating with the patient, um, you always get asked, you could have open, um, let me use the text box, that's easier. You can have open or um, closed questions, all right? So remember, go back to your book if you don't remember that. Um, there's verbal and nonverbal communication. All right, so these questions are gonna kind of speak to like your attitude with them, your facial expression, gestures, et cetera. Um, and there's also communicating with the healthcare team. All right, so uh, basically um, your professionalism will come into play. So you might get one or two questions on professionalism. Your documentation, um, and so we talked about um, this is written communication with your documentation. And so you have to know the difference between the military time and standard time um, so that you could document correctly. Um, during my program, there's an INO course. So they might ask you a question um, kind of stemming when they say, have you uh, someone drank a cup of coffee, which I'm drinking right now as I shoot this recording for you. Someone drank a cup of coffee, um, which is 240. They had IV fluids, they urinated 300. You know, what's the intake and output? Although it's a fluid question, but they wanna make sure that you're gonna tally and document that correctly. Um, and shift report, you're not supposed to leave, until you pass off shift report to somebody, okay? And so there's way more with communication. Um, another thing with patient, sorry, I meant to say that before, you could look, review how you communicate with the patient, but also patients might have some communication deficiencies. Someone might have a trait and they're unable to verbalize. So they have a board with common pictures or pen and paper so they can write things down. So go back and refresh yourself into those communication, but pretty much the open closed-ended questions, verbal, non-verbal um, will get you covered there and speaking to somebody in a dignified manner. Okay, so infection. Control, I'm going to do a little thing that will cover this here. So HAI is called hospital acquired infection, a nosocomial infection. Um, and this is when we are the ones as healthcare providers that make someone sick. So the biggest source of that in healthcare has been a while since I've seen the latest research, um, but the number one thing are, are is catheters. Um, so if you notice the skills, a lot of the skills have to do with catheter care, um, and that's making sure E. coli doesn't travel up and infect the person, travel into the bladder. So that's why we do um, PPEs, hand hygiene, to make sure we don't take viruses from one room and keep spreading it from room to room to room. Um, isolation. And so I'm going to show you the chain of infection or infection cycle, which will cover a good bit of infection questions that you might get. Okay, so this is the nitty gritty of the chain of infection or infection cycle. You start with a host. Host, right? So the host has a microbe or a pathogen. Microbe and pathogen could be the um, is the same thing. Like for example, we have staph on our skin, and the staph doesn't make me sick. But once it makes me sick, it's now called a pathogen. Okay. So you start here at the top. So let's just say let's use um, let's use uh, HIV as the disease we're talking about. So person A has HIV, okay? The HIV lives in a reservoir, all right? So reservoir is where the virus or bacteria lives. And in this example, HIV lives in blood and bodily fluid. So I like to tell my students, 
if ground zero, the first person had a disease, although you might be compassionate, you wouldn't care much because if it was contained to that person only and didn't spread, right? So HIV reservoir, it still hasn't infected anybody, right? Or the potential to infect. So now, uh-oh, we get out here, we have, I'm just gonna use text boxes because it's quicker. Portal of exit. Okay, so you have the portal of exit. Um, and let me put the text boxes. Okay, so let me go back to my drawing tool here. So you have the host, um, H and the host has HIV. Um, the HIV lives in a reservoir, which is um, for HIV cases, uh, blood and bodily fluid. You have portal of exit, right? It needs to leave the person somehow. So for example, that's why we want to make sure that wound dressings are always clean, dry, and intact um, because it keeps it contaminating. Anytime the bed becomes soiled with blood or wound drainage, that's a portal of exit. So if a wound wasn't clean, dry, intact, or if someone had cut themselves, that would be a portal of exit. So now the HIV has exited the person's body. You have a mode of transmission. Now, test question here. The mode of or method of transmission, mode or method of transmission determines what PPE, personal protective equipment you wear. You then have, so HIV transmits through contact, right? You don't catch HIV in the air. Um, it has to transmit through contact. Then it now it has to enter another person, right? Because remember, we're talking about an infection cycle, chain of infection, meaning how does it get from one person to another? It has to enter another person. So maybe you're a healthcare worker that's not wearing gloves and you have a paper cut, okay? Um, and then you have susceptible host. Meaning there's sometimes you could be exposed to HIV, but the viral load wasn't high enough. So your susceptibility, this is your immunity, um, how likely you are to get sick. So test questions will exist in identifying where in this chain of infection you are. They'll give you a scenario, um, so-and-so coughs and sneezes, what's the portal of exit, something to that effect. Then there'll be certain types of questions that'll seek to break the chain or cycle of infection, okay? Um, so the host and reservoir can't be broken, right? You have it, that's what it is. Um, so here, portal of exit, you can break the cycle or chain here um, if we're dealing with HIV by um, wearing a condom. If we were dealing with um, the C word, um, you could wear a mask. You could break it there. You could break the chain of infection here by wearing your PPEs as a healthcare worker appropriately. You can break it here um, by, if it's HIV, the next person wearing a condom, or if it's um, the vid wearing your mask, which is an N95. You could break it here in terms of vaccinations. That's what vaccines are attempting to do to make you not susceptible, all right? And so all of that is so that person A doesn't spread this infection to person B. All right, so this is a good kind of like summary of these three concepts. Again, when I'm saying summary, it's not all inclusive. I'm saying straight to the point where I know questions will exist. Again, this is for people who've taken the school. Um, so it's not for someone who has not taken the program at all because it is a refresher. Let's keep going here. So health promotion, under the concept of health promotion, pretty much is all the things that you do, these promote health, okay? Um, it promotes health by keeping the patient at the optimal level of health. Optimal means like if someone is a quadriplegic, you're not promoting their health by trying to get them to be a marathon runner. You're trying to get them to their highest level, okay? If your child's in the first grade, you're trying to get them to be the best first grader. It's not an expectation that they're the best high schooler, okay? So I am going to go through here and basically just, it's not a review of all these topics, but basically point out test questions that you may find or exist within these health promotion topics. And a lot of them are skills too that you get tested on, um, but let's go through. So this is an important page here. Um, okay, 
So bed making here, of course, knowing how to make the bed, but again, we're not talking about skills here. We're doing a review. Bed making, you, it's part of health promotion because you want to make sure the person is clean. And when you make the bed and when you do the skills, you'll see that they say that you're doing it in a manner that avoids friction and shear um, because it's part of um, skin integumentary, um, keeping the skin intact. And all of that helps to avoid pressure ulcers. So remember when we talked about layering concepts, you might see... Um, you might think, oh, the concept is hygiene, right? Because a lot of these concepts is hygiene, but the way the question's written, they've added another concept. So although on the second recording, we had concepts for people who are in my CNA refresher course, I want to tell you the feedback that I've been getting. They may talk about the concepts here of hygiene and things like that, but the overall, the bigger concept of safety supersedes it, takes priority. Now, let me tell you what I mean by that. You'll get test questions where we say the resident has a right to choose, right? But um, the resident doesn't have a right to choose to get into a bed with another resident and take a bath, right? Because safety takes priority over that resident rights, okay? So when they're talking about bed making, if somebody is in their right state of mind, alert and oriented times three or times seven, they could decide they don't wanna bathe today or make their bed today. But some, if somebody's confused, you can't let them sit there and not bathe, not make their bed at all ever, okay? So you have, it all depends on how the question's written. Oral hygiene, you're always gonna get a question on the unconscious patient. So um, two things, the unconscious patient, remember you do the, um, I'm writing unconscious here, you do the uh, tooth set or swab and their head is turned to the side because you don't want them to choke on their own um, secretions. Another thing is with the oral hygiene, remember it's extremely important because uh, bacteria in the mouth can lead to heart bacteria, which is called a uh, heart infection, which is called endocarditis. The patient is always sitting up, head of bed up, okay? Um, bathing, I'm trying to think of questions. It, the questions are going to be around privacy, the resident's right to privacy, Bathing is a very intimate um, experience. And so you want to make sure they're covered and the skills. That's why we have the bath blanket and we obviously close the privacy curtain. So with bathing, think of it from a privacy perspective. Think of it from a privacy perspective. Um, there was something else I wanted to say with bathing too. Uh, you could, going back to, if the person's alert and oriented and they don't want to bathe, if you try to bathe them against their will, that could be considered um, battery, okay? And so that was one thing I did not mention on um, this, under this, oh, the second screen, under legal and ethics, the, there are a couple of terms they always ask you. They're always going to ask you negligence, assault, and assault is the threat of something, and battery is actually physically doing something. Now, there are more legal terms, but those are the ones that I found that are most common. Okay, with grooming, um, remember the resident has a right to decide what clothes they're going to wear. Okay, um, with grooming, I'm trying to think what else. You want to make sure they groom like appropriately. Um, dressing. So urine needs, you're going to ask a fair amount of urine questions, okay? So and typically, an adult makes one ml of urine. Oh, I moved this around. No, I don't know how to undo it. One ml of urine per minute. So remember, you're the ones emptying the catheter. Um, and so... We want to know that's 60 mLs in an hour. So if you've emptied the uh, catheter every four hours, they should theoretically have 240 milliliters in there, okay? Urine needs, someone needs to be toileted every two hours. Um, toileted every two hours um, is typically a test question. So I'm going to put Q2 hours, okay? Um, <clears throat> geez, Q2 hours. And so also... 
toileting also prevents falls. So a big part of your CNA exam, the multiple choice component, a lot of questions are gonna be around preventing falls, which makes sense because it's a safety. So don't forget the toileting every two hours. And then they're gonna ask you how to safely how to safely toilet, meaning how to safely put somebody on a commode, all right, or a bedpan. Um, bowel needs questions might be around um, if they haven't had a bowel movement to notify the nurse. Let me see. Um, nutrition. Nutrition, there are a couple of things. You could look at it from a nutrition standpoint, which there are diet orders that you should know. You should know what NPO means. It means nothing by mouth. All right, you're always going to get tested on a diabetic. So I'm going to put DM um, for diabetes, um, diabetic um, mel mellitus. I always butcher that. Um, so diabetes, you should know in your plan of care uh, if the patient can eat or uh, because if the nurse hasn't checked their blood sugar and you give them something, that's going to alter that. Um, this fluid restriction is a common one. Um, where the doctor will restrict the patients on the amount of food they could drink per day. NAS is no added salt for your hypertensives. Um, and then house diet is simply just a regular diet. Now, this is not the full scope of all diets, but this is essentially it. So remember, we're talking about test questions because it's straight to the point. You may get asked, you have to ensure that it's the right patient and right diet order. So that's a safety. And another safety thing with nutrition is um, you have to make sure that the patient is sitting up, okay? The patient's sitting up high followers um, and that they're able to eat. So two terms, and I'm just gonna type them out because it's easier than drawing, that you'll get asked is dysphagia and aspiration, okay? Um, aspiration is when some liquid or food goes down to the lungs, okay? When people choke, they say it's going down the wrong pipe. Um, they don't belong in the lungs. The only thing that belongs in the lungs is air for gas exchange, okay? So aspiration leads to aspiration pneumonia. Dysphagia is when you have a problem chewing. And so with that, people will um, start thickening the liquid, or that's how patients get pureed diets and get their food chopped up, et cetera, okay? So you'll always get asked um, an aspiration question, dysphagia question. So these are terms, make sure that you know. Um, mm -hmm. Fluid needs. Basically, I told you intake and output. Your body wants to be in equilibrium. So another two questions that you'll get asked in terms of fluid, edema versus dehydration. Most people are familiar with dehydration is when your output is more than your input. Um, but with edema, edema, your extremities are uh, swollen and that's because of excess fluid. It is different. So edema, with edema, fluid um, is increase, but don't take it as the same as swelling. So test question that they always like to ask, if a bee stings me and it swells up, or someone punched me in my face and it swelled, you know, it, it, it got swollen. Um, you can put ice on that, but that is a different swelling than if my leg is big from edema, which is excess fluid. That's not ice, okay? And that's a good question that people like to ask. With that, you need to wear, they'll always ask you for TED or compression stockings, okay? And what you do to help edema, uh, in the legs is um, compression or compression or anti slash anti embolism stockings and to elevate the extremity so that it can drain. Um, okay, so that's a good review of fluid needs, vital signs, all right? So one, how to do vital signs, but I'm actually gonna tell you a few test questions here. I'm tired of drawing, so just be auditory and then you can rewind if you need to listen to something again. So vital signs, for example, the temperature, let's start there with the thermometer. You're always gonna get asked the test question um, if, if you were taking an oral temperature, um, if they were drinking hot coffee, uh, me and my coffee, if they were drinking um, a cold drink, or if they were chewing gum, you know, you wait 30 seconds. 
you're always going to get asked the safety questions in terms of a rectal temperature. I DPH has us purchase glass thermometers, but I haven't seen a glass thermometer in a healthcare setting in a while. Um, and so if you're doing a rectal temperature, you need a doctor's order, you need lubrication, and then the safety, Where remember I told you that takes precedent. If your patient is, say, agitated or moving around, it becomes unsafe to do a rectal temperature, so it would be contraindicated, and you'd have to report to the nurse. So those are temperature questions you get asked. Um, what's the next vital sign? Um, let's do blood pressure. Blood pressure... Um, the number one question you get asked is that if the cuff is too small, it's going to give you a falsely elevated pressure. If the cuff is too loose, it's going to give you a falsely lower blood pressure. Okay, so that's key. That's the test question that always gets asked. Um, so it's important to have the correct cuff size. Um, uh, respiratory rates. You don't want to, you want to make sure the person's calm so you get a good respiratory rate. Um, you don't want them to alter their breathing patterns. And then the pulse, you never check a pulse with your thumb. Um, you always check it with your index fingers. And you never, the arm is never dependent or raised above the level of the heart. Okay, so again, this is not how do you do them because those are skills, but these are kind of reviews. It's a straight to the point bullet review. When we deal with exercise and activity, somebody needs, depending on their ability, they might get out of bed um, with ambulation or you assist them twice, right? People need exercise and uh, um, activity so their muscles don't atrophy. Um, so the questions will be around doing it safely, whether it is a um, uh, transfer gate belt or et cetera, okay? Um, comfort, rest, and sleep. People who are, you need to go back and review the complications of being bedridden complications of bed rest. And I guess it goes with exercise and activity too, if you're unable to do anything. So complications of bed rest is that you have is constipation. You have, you can get pressure ulcers, you can get depressed, um, you can get aspiration pneumonia because they're not turning. So I don't want you to think exercise and activity is running laps, even turning a person every two hours. So just like toileting every two hours, you should turn and reposition every two hours. This is going to prevent them from getting um, pressure ulcers. Comfort and sleep um, and rest is that a patient needs a good night's sleep and you need to make the environment comfortable for them um, to be able to relax. And pressure injuries, again, if you look at the turn and reposition every two hours, don't leave a patient um, wet like on a pad. Um, document if you see anything while bathing and tell the nurse um, and that pressure ulcers could be prevented. You might wanna review the stages of a pressure ulcer. You might get one question on that or two, um, but pretty much is the biggest is how to prevent a pressure ulcer. So here, safety, you're going to get a lot of test questions that fall under this concept of safety. So you could think of the patient safety, the environment safety um, and workplace safety, okay? So let's talk about, let's do environment safety first. I tell students anything that has an acronym, you're gonna get tested on. So workplace safety, you see we cover a lot of uh, fire, right? So you're going to get asked the race acronym and the PASS acronym, okay? So remember the RACE acronym is Rescue, Alarm, Confine, and Evacuate under a fire. The PASS acronym, um, what is it? Pull, aim, squeeze, and sweep, okay? How to use the fire extinguisher. So you're going to get asked these a, a lot. Um, there are environment questions too. Um, a lot of people are working in places with dementia and Alzheimer's, right, nursing home. So um, the environment making sure um, like alarms are on doors and um, 
and trying to prevent people from escaping or eloping. Um, I'm trying to think other environment ones. So I know the, all right, in order to get it back on the screen, I had to make it smaller. Sorry, I'm still learning how to navigate this whiteboard. And so workplace safety, uh, they will talk about your own safety, meaning your body mechanics. Um, also, there's something like lateral violence, meaning um, making sure everyone's safe in terms of the way that there's no hostility, sexual harassment, and things like that. Um, so your workplace safety, big on um, body mechanics, okay? Um, so I would definitely review that. Um, that is not the back. That's the base of your support. It's not your back. Um, it's your lower portion of your body. Um, and then safety as it pertains to the patient. So when I say here that safety um, topic is in everything, everything can be made, even though the concept looks like hygiene, it can be made to turn into a safety question. And now that I say this, I'm actually um, remembering um, with bathing or grooming here, I didn't talk about shaving. And a big safety question that gets asked is about a safety razor um, and that you don't use a straight blade because somebody can get cut. People are on anticoagulants or blood thinners, right? So we don't use a, a straight blade. And also in terms of grooming, um, we didn't talk about foot care. Foot care, you only file your resident's nails, treat foot care like everyone's a diabetic. You only file your resident's nails. You don't clip them. You don't use that grater because of diabetic neuropathy. So that is a big one that I forgot to mention. Prevent falls, prevent falls, prevent falls. You should just take a paper, make a list of things to prevent falls. So non-skid socks, toileting every two hours, assist with ambulation, answering the call light, because like the whole test um, or a good amount is going to be about preventing falls, okay? So with restraints, you need a doctor's order to put restraints on. Restraints have to be checked every two hours. You have to check the pulse distal to the restraint. And then when you put the restraint, another question they like to ask is that you could fit your fingers flat underneath the restraint to make sure it's not too tight. We talked about where your lifts, body mechanics. Your, in terms of body mechanics, your body mechanics, but also you need to know your um, positions of how patients are positioned, which we have fowlers, semi-fowlers, um, lateral, supine is on the back, and prone is on the stomach, okay? Um, there are safety questions that exist around transfers. Turn on the lights. Uh, my children are here. There are safety questions that exist around transfers. All right, so this is the day three straight to the point continued. As you can see the background and my outfit has changed, I had to go to a different setting. So we are going to pick up, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, right where we left off, okay? So let me open up my whiteboard here and I wanna to get to, so we did all of this. Um, a couple of things I was going over to make sure that I have completely, you know, touched everything. And one thing I'm still getting used to the whiteboard. So sometimes it's out of focus and I don't know how to slide left, right, up or down. So I was missing some things. So we went over this thoroughly. What I didn't see on my other screen here was this developmental stages as well. Um, so your concept, legal, ethics, communication, infection control, health promotion, safety, and developmental stages. Um, and so that includes, you will get some asked some questions about pediatrics, just the difference like growth and development. Um, and some of those questions might be centered around keeping the home safe for a child, like poison, um, the caps, so they don't, um, you know, poison themselves with cleaning products, suffocation, 
Um, I'm trying to think what else. Um, the older they get to developmental stages, that's when you start getting into medical containers like pill bottles. So they don't mix up their pills. They don't trip on area rugs. And we'll talk more about that. And then I didn't really touch on healthcare agencies. There's always a question on like, what kind of agency can a CNA work in? And CNAs can work in long-term care facilities, hospitals, rehab, skilled nursing facilities. So usually that answer, don't quote me on it, but the ones I've seen are usually all of the above, okay? Um, all right, so let's just go through here. I'm just, all my scribbles on this whiteboard. <laughs> now, a couple of things um, with this uh, health promotion, I wanted to make sure that I covered um, grooming, and if it's repetitive, I'm putting together two videos, so forgive me. Um, grooming, you're going to get asked a question about shaving and that people, um, when they're shaved, you don't use a regular razor that, you know, we use in the shower. Someone can get cut. Patients can be on blood thinners. So you always use a safety razor. So you're going to get asked that grooming question. Also with foot care, Although foot care is not here, but it could be part of bathing, it's not here in isolation. Foot care, always consider it as though you're doing the feet of a diabetic. Um, and so diabetics, you always file their nails. You do not um, use clippers or like that grater, you know, when you get a pedicure because of diabetic neuropathy. Um, and that's how diabetics end up with a toe amputation or a foot amputation. And I believe I covered everything else here. And let's go to the page. Okay, I couldn't get all of this to... So what I'm going to do, I'm gonna erase the notes and start over because I was having trouble with the whiteboard. Oh, I didn't mess it up again. Um, okay, so when we think about um, safety, safety is huge and um, on the day two recording, we talked about concepts. I was talking to you about how a question can have several concepts um, overlapping one another. <clears throat> So safety is always embedded, even if it's a grooming question, like I just gave you an example of using an electrical razor. It's a grooming question, hygiene question, but they made it a safety question. Safety takes priority, okay? So you really need to understand how concepts can be dealing with several concepts within one question. And um, for you, those of you who have paid for this refresher course, it was covered on the second day. <clears throat> Those of you who have not, you could register for the course to get the full um, scope of it. So safety, let's talk about patient safety, environment safety, workplace safety, okay? So with let's deal with the environment first. Environment um, safety are things like I tell students whenever you see an acronym, you're probably going to get tested on it. So you're always going to get the fire, um, which is the environment um, safety question. So the two acronyms race and pass to make sure you know race means uh, rescue, um, alarm, confine and evacuate evacuate. Pass means pull, aim, squeeze, and sweep, okay? So um, you're always going to get those two acronyms, and it's going to be a scenario for you to identify where in this acronym you are. So make sure you're familiar with that. Environment um, also means as well um, the code cards. Making um, environment, they always talk about kind of like um, the electrical outlets, making sure um, things are plugged in the correct outlet. There are certain machines like ventilators that need to be plugged in the red outlet so that if the hospital loses electricity, those things are on a generator, right? Um, environmental safety, you have your biohazard. <clears throat> Your biohazard usually is the red garbage bag or the red sharps container, right? Um, if there's needle, um, occupational health, your OSHA, everyone when they start a job is going to get um, tested, get the OSHA orientation, the workplace safety dealing with um, biohazard materials. There's always a safety data sheet. I'm trying to think what other safety. In terms of dealing with people with dementia, they might have, there might be doors that are alarmed because they might try to escape or elope 
elopement is what I want to say. Um, okay, and so again, like I'm saying, it's not all encompassing, but this is the straight to the point, like core review of topics. Okay, workplace safety. With your workplace, your body mechanics is going to play a big part because they wanna make sure you're not hurt. All right, um, workplace safety also includes, workplace safety also includes like lateral violence, um, how you are to uh, speak to each other, you know, sexual harassment, um, things of that nature, okay? So patient safety, of course, we care about the environment and workplace safety, but the biggest thing is patient safety, all right? So safety topics are in everything, like I've been saying. So bold, highlight, look up, everything is a fall prevention. You're going to get tons of fall prevention. Um, so what do you have under fall preventions? You have your non-skid socks to make sure that someone doesn't fall. Um, you toilet them every two hours. I'm going to put Q2 hours. That is so most falls happen when people are trying to get to the bathroom. Most falls happen at change of shift, right? So you might have worked getting off at three and you lasted your rounds at one, you should do your rounds right before three because you might've seen a patient at one, the new shift coming on has to get report, um, has to, and then that might be the last person they see. So they might not see that patient till 4.30. So technically no one has laid eyes on that patient from like one to 4.30, right? So constant surveillance and everything like that. So there's always a section in your book about fall prevention. You wanna make sure you definitely um, go through that so that you can um, get every point. And I feel like, one second, I just want to make sure, and I'm going through the book here, I feel like there's one thing. Um, mm -hmm. All right. So that's that. Uh, restraints. Restraints, you need a doctor's order for restraints. A doctor's order is needed for restraints. Um, you check it every two hours. And then when you put the restraints on, you have to make sure your fingers fit flatly um, here, okay, so that it's not too tight and cut off circulation. Those are the three big points for restraints. Also, just like with the Hoyer lift I mentioned in the past, blood glucose and restraints, you don't just walk into a place and start putting them on, you have to be trained by your workplace. So if you notice that part of the federal regulations, um, uh, restraints is not like part of a skill, a mandated, because some places allow you to put restraints on, some places don't, okay? The same with Hoya Lift, you need the training. So body mechanics, um, your back is not the base of your body mechanics. It is your, you know, your lower... I, if you watch some of my videos, like you squat, right? It's your lower legs. It's not your back. Um, that's your base of body mechanics. So you have to watch your own body mechanics, the patient body mechanics. You have to make sure you're not pulling in a patient in a manner that could pop their shoulder, dislocate their shoulder. And when we get to skills, I have tons of videos um, for you to watch about that. Transfer, you need to know on the plan of care how a patient transfers. Um, if it's assist times one, assist times two, you can get asked gate belt questions, um, the stretcher, anything they're transferring to and from has to be locked, okay? Um, safety when it comes to confusion and dementia. So a couple of things. Um, Elderly people, when they get a urinary tract infection, they tend to be extremely acutely um, Confuse, and so acute means when something suddenly happens and you're not gonna live with it the rest of your life. And chronic means you're living with it for a long term where someone has an actual diagnosis of dementia. So um, you have to be mindful and that sense that patient becomes a huge safety risk because they are not able to really comprehend and follow directions and things like that. I talked to you about dementia, maybe people eloping, um, so here in vision and speech, um, when it comes to safety, if someone doesn't have their hearing aid and their inner ear, they could fall. If they don't have their glasses, they could trip over area rug and fall. So if any one of those senses are inhibited, they might be able to hurt themselves. Speech, if they're unable to speak, they're unable to make their needs met and things of that nature. So you have to provide something else for them. 
Um, okay, so I think that is all, that's a good bit of safety. Deve developmental stages, okay? So I had a little bit of tongue tie there. So developmental stages, you want to understand what changes typically happen with the older adults, okay? Um, so whether they sleep more or less, drink more or less, um, get increased difficulty swallowing, you know, their night vision and all of that. So there's some things that are part of normal developmental changes. And so they will tend to ask you that to see if you understand that it's not abnormal. Um, it's normal for your 80 year old person to have that going on. Um, growth and development, uh, with children, you want to be mindful of infant suffocation in a crib or having the, you know, safety caps on products, especially if you're engaging in your home care um, certificate. What else? End of life, grieving. There are the stages of grieving. Just memorize that. You tend to get a test question on that. So stages of grieving. And I would read it out to you here if I could find it. Um, stages of grieving. The difference between hospice, so hospice is more of a, hospice is when it's not a cure, right? Um, doesn't mean that you don't care for the patient. Sometimes they expect that the patient's life might end within the next six months. And so hospice is the quality of life um, and you're doing comfort, okay? So you may not do vital signs every four hours on someone who's um, on hospice precautions. So they tend to ask you that. Um, a lot of it will be um, supporting the family. Um, so there's hospice and then there is imminently dying. Imminently, I butchered the spelling. Um, dying, so act or actively dying. Um, actively dying, they get a change in their breathing pattern. Um, so differentiate that hospice doesn't mean that you're actively dying um, in the next 12 hours, but then there's a transition that somebody makes where you expect that they might not be here in the next few hours. Um, and there's a difference in terms of how they present. So here, the questions that they always ask is support of the family, understanding the family stages of grief after death has happened, and for you to understand that in hospice care, you're dealing with comfort, okay? And then postpartum care, um, CNA's postpartum care, postmortem care, not postpartum, sorry, that's when you have a baby. Postmortem care is when someone has passed away um, <clears throat> and you're preparing the body in the room to take down to the morgue, um, that you respect uh, the body and dignity. Um, also that you, it's a sensitive time for the family, you know, that you're there for the family. The family might in turn become your new patient, right? Providing their needs, bringing them water, giving them time alone in the body, closing the door. You know what I mean? Making sure they're not disturbed, etc. CNAs do not call the time of death. That's done by the doctors. Nurses don't call the time of death either. And with rehabilitation, activities of daily living, it's kind of a lot of health promotion stuff we were talking about, um, medical equipment like transfer belt, shower chair, um, those occupational utensils. And basically you go by the plan of care and make sure you know how to use all of these things correctly and provide it to the patient and assist the patient with it as they needed to perform that particular activity um, of daily living. And I think, one thing I wanted to say here with oral hygiene, I might not have gotten a chance to say again with me putting two videos together. Um, we covered the unconscious patient. I did not cover denture care, I don't believe. Um, so with denture care, you'll get test questions. The biggest thing is preventing the dentures from breaking. Um, that's why you always carry dentures in a denture cup and you line the sink with a linen, not a paper towel, but like a linen washcloth or hand towel or something should it slip from your hands. I believe, and again, this is not your entire CNA curriculum, but this is certainly a good, good refresher for you. Okay, enjoy. Um, people who want to take the complete refresher course where I go over multiple choice questions, concepts, um, definitely um, 
sign up. And those of you in this class, next we're going to do uh, patient skills and then we're gonna do a practice exam, okay? Take care.